there's literally only one way that I can start this video. It's Britney, bitch. If you ask the average pop culture enjoyer or, you know, your neighbor, your teacher, your best friend, your doctor, what they thought of Britney Spears in 2007, then you probably would have heard the following words. Cringe, messy, irresponsible, stupid, spoiled, white trash. We look back on her plight now differently given what we know about how her agency and her autonomy had been violated in the conservatorship that followed this very public breakdown. From the infamous head shaving incident to almost dropping her baby on the street and driving with an infant on her lap, there was no private personal humiliation of Britney Spears that we weren't privy to in 2007. Britney's 2007 album Blackout was born in the thick of her darkest moments. It was recorded during her divorce, but released during an increasingly bizarre series of events. You might think that the record she would have made at this time amidst all this public and humiliating turmoil would have been one of two things, either a soppy, overly confessional, and perhaps apologetic mea culpa, or a steaming pile of assembly line manufactured garbage pop churned out to appease the gods of a punishing major label deal. But neither of those probabilities came true. Instead, what she curated in this time was an eclectic, dirty, dark, and mysterious compilation of some of the best pop music of the 21st century. The ripple effects of this album and how it used vocal effects and new technologies to distort the instantly recognizable husk of Spears' smooth, sensitive, and vaguely Southern voice are still frequently heard in today's pop music. Just look around you. Every artist that you know and love as a pop enjoyer has been influenced by Britney Spears in some way, shape, or form, from Charlie XCX to Slater, Selena Gomez, Ariana Grande, Kesha, Taylor Swift, and Lana Del Rey, they all bear the mark of the legendary Miss Britney Spears in some way, shape, or form. And yet, despite being one of the most influential albums in contemporary pop, this album came and went in a flash with very little fanfare. Her personal life at the time far eclipsed anything that she was able to create artistically, and so her magnum opus came and went, and was truly only best assessed in hindsight. And hindsight has sadly always been part of the Britney Spears legacy. Her pain, humiliation, and her trouble has shifted the needle of public opinion more times than we can count. But this video is not necessarily about the ways in which her agency has been taken away, though I think it's definitely an undercurrent that will run through this video essay. It's about the pivotal moment where she stepped into her own power and burrowed deep into her art to find a sense of escape and release, a reprieve from a world that would not for a moment in time leave her alone. Britney found her solace sweating on the hypothetical dance floor, rubbing up against hot guys, poo-pooing sad songs, and looking out for the next hottest invite in town. Simply not caring what you think when you inevitably encounter her breaking it down on some dark corner of the dance floor. I would argue that Blackout is the last we've heard of a truly free Britney, and who knows, maybe that's it from her. Maybe that's the legacy that she wants to leave behind. But if this album alone is that legacy, then her job as a tastemaker and a culture shaper is well and truly done. In this video, I'm going to revisit this iconic short-lived era of one of our most intriguing and mysterious pop stars discussing its creation, its impact, and its legacy. If you're new here, my name is Zach. I am the Swiftologist, and I make thoughtful weekly videos about pop culture. If you like video essays, if you like thoughtful content, then maybe subscribe to my channel. I think that you'll like it if you stick around for a while. I also have a podcast called The Evolution of a Snake, which is specifically devoted to the life and times of Taylor Swift from an analytical and critical lens. So if you like Taylor and you're interested in pop culture discussions, then I think that you would like that. I will leave our Patreon linked down below. So before we can jump into exactly how Blackout came to be, I think it's important as always to set the scene and look at the context in which this album and this creature, this Britney Spears, this version of her that was so shocking to the public at the time in which that emerged. So the year is 2007, and this is a seismic year in pop culture history just for one reason and one reason alone, the invention of the iPhone. The iPhone is, as we all know by now, a technological development that changed our digital instincts forever. It expanded the proliferation of the camera phone and married it with the increasing accessibility of social media. The camera phone turned everyone into a photographer, a producer, a tattletale, increasing citizen surveillance, feeding this paparazzi culture, and emboldening a new kind of voyeurism. This active passive observer who doesn't have to get involved in the mess of whatever it is they're talking about but has a public voice to speak on it and is completely empowered by anonymity this i think we can all you know surmise from what's happened since we've given a voice to the anonymous has not really been a good thing for the culture so the social platforms at this time were definitely evolving and taking shape and much of what would happen in the blackout rollout i think ends up becoming very emblematic of the internet culture that we have today the concept of the viral video the celebrity worship culture the turning of a celebrity into a personality rather than just an artist. YouTube in particular ends up being a very important part of the Blackout story when we get to the VMAs in 2007. So where 
was Britney amidst all of this development in pop culture? Well, she was commencing a trope that we know all too well with female celebrities, traversing a path trampled by many. Mariah Carey, Lindsay Lohan, and Paris Hilton had already undergone public ridicule for having a meltdown or a breakdown and not being able to keep it together in public, enduring one public humiliation or another. There was definitely something inherently misogynistic about how the public received and interpreted these aberrations from perfection in our troubled starlets, the idea of a damsel in distress. Messy men are heralded as creative geniuses whose bad behavior only fuels their creative output. From this period of time, we could look at male celebrities like Heath Ledger and Robert Downey Jr., who kind of benefited from that lionization of the dark, deep, brooding, mysterious artist. The thinking goes that their suffering begets good work and begets some sort of noble or honorable pursuit of creative genius. However, the women that experience similar kinds of suffering in the public limelight are not afforded the same credibility. In 2007, Amy Winehouse and Britney Spears were arguably the two most famous women in the world. And that's largely because we, the public, were captivated by how their lives were cratering on the world stage. Amy Winehouse's brand was always a little bit darker, a little bit edgier, with substance abuse playing a thematic role in her work from the jump. She was never a children's entertainer, unlike Britney Spears. But nevertheless, the notoriously brutal British press had a field day reporting on Amy's various exploits. One particularly cruel and horrible example of this was photographing her running through the streets with open bleeding sores, presumably from heroin use on her feet, getting into physical altercations with paparazzi, and just, you know, acting intoxicated in public. There's no value in comparing one person's struggle to another, and I don't want to say that it was easier for Amy to endure this, because being the bad girl comes with its own set of reductive tropes and unfair characterizations, but Britney's fall from grace was far more shocking, and it fueled a greater interest in not just the how of the change in her appearance and behavior, but the why. Britney was playing with a different set of cards right from the jump. Since the debut of her first single, Baby One More Time, she has been a lightning rod for culture wars in the United States. The kerfuffle over her increasingly sexy image as she tried to age out of being a Disney star, the obsessive discourse about her virginity, and the perverted fixation on her body by male journalists. Truly things that are disgusting and would not fly in today's day and age. Um, how do you feel about all the constant speculation about your virginity and whether you are a virgin or not? Have there been any changes on that front? <laughs> <laughs> That's a personal question to her body, there was this weird sort of fixation on what had or hadn't been done to it and who had or hadn't had access to it. She was always kind of seen as a public art piece. People felt entitled to her and they projected their own interpretations of what she meant loudly onto her and at her. Being a centerpiece in any form of culture war has definitely been a pattern that has only repeated itself throughout her career. Most recently, she has stirred up conversations about civil liberties with the Free Britney movement after being freed from her conservatorship, under which her civil liberties were literally violated for multiple years on end, and she is currently challenging our expectations of what a free Britney should look like, since she's not behaving the perfect way that everybody wants her to, or the way that we have imagined her to be in the past. I don't know if you've noticed this, and I still see it today on social media, everyone feels like they have something to say about the way that she behaves, a remark to pass on how she dances spinning at the camera, or how she interacts with her social media. The pattern that we have is we root for her, we criticize her, we destroy her, we try to remake her, and then we rinse and repeat the process. So the sense of ownership that is disproportionate to other pop stars, I think, is partly because of how Britney was marketed from the very beginning of her career. One of the truest examples of a produced pop star. She was told where to go, what to wear, who to be, how to act, and what to sing. And there are kind of terrifying examples of this in the songs that she was given, not even songs that she wrote, by Max Martin. In Lucky, she cries about being a starlet that has a broken heart and an overprotected. She Elements about how she basically isn't allowed to do anything because everybody makes the decisions for her and she doesn't want to live in these shackles and constraints anymore. So even before she entered her conservatorship, she definitely lived a lot of her life conforming to what other people wanted her to do or living in a cage of some sort. But that forcible hand that tried to make her one of the biggest stars in the world worked. And despite all of that negative chatter in the early days, there was one thing that everybody agreed upon. This was a generational talent. Her music was successful, her performances were widely admired, and her look was often emulated. She was charismatic enough to stand out from the crowd of the Britney Farm copycats that were launched on many different labels to ride her coattails, but she was sincerely earnest enough to take on whatever shape was prescribed to her. Britney's trouble really truly started when she tried to chart her own path. She was never supposed to grow up or get old. The Britney we know is forever young. With 
with a taut toned stomach and long bronze limbs, flowing blonde tresses, and a wide girlish smile. She is expected to be both relatable and aspirational. Your older sister, your best friend, your girlfriend, depending on who you are. Think of how many times that clip of Slay For You has gone viral since we've entered the social media age. This is not only how we remember Britney, but it's how we imagine her to be now. How can one person bear all the weight of these disparate expectations? An interesting fictionalization of the Britney story came in the 2021 edition of the Black Mirror Anthology, where we meet Ashley O, the unfailingly upbeat, positive, and radiant kind of pop star that is both neutral and charismatic enough to spread her message and sell her records across the world, who is controlled completely creatively by her aunt. She's like a UN ambassador for pop culture. Her mission, dance a little, sing along, and buy my songs. Black Mirror is known for its uncanny portrayal of a fictional reality that is very similar to our own. And when we compare Britney's conservatorship and the fight for her freedom to the story of Ashley O, the series takes on an even spookier and more prescient element. At the end of the series, we see Ashley break free from the confines of the mind control that she's under and perform what looks like a small punk show in a dive bar. And the blackout era was Britney's punk show in a dive bar moment. Now let's talk about the creative process. Blackout actually underwent a pretty prolific writing and recording process that was evidenced by the amount of finished demos that are out there and just didn't make it onto the final track list. The recording and writing period for this record stretched from when she had just given birth to her second child to when she was fresh off the head shave and attacking the paparazzi with an umbrella, the finalization of her divorce, and being checked out of Malibu Promises' famous, noted, iconic celebrity rehab after just one day. While Britney was pregnant with her second child, she briefly entered her Madonna Ray of Light era with a sappy ballad called Someday I Will Understand. This was not really the Britney that we knew, and the song didn't really make a smash or ignite any sort of new era. Pop music in 2007 was undergoing a bit of a transformation, pivoting away from the straightforward, bright bubblegum pop of the late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, the wheelhouse in which Britney Spears was very familiar, and careening towards something more mature and contemporary. R&B hip-hop influences had well and truly taken hold in Justin Timberlake's Future Sex Love Sounds, Nelly Furtado's Loose, and Rihanna's Good Girl Gone Bad. Britney had actually kind of pioneered that more like urban contemporary incorporation into her pop music with her album In The Zone in 2003. And we know that Miss Britney Spears has always been ahead of her time. What was more nascent in pop in 2007 was the introduction of electronic dance music into the mainstream. This was where Britney was really clairvoyant with her work on Blackout. She really mainstreamed the vocal distortion, sample work, auto-tune, and synth sounds that came to define a new era of pop. Britney was credited as the executive producer on Blackout, and this is to date her only executive production credit on any of her albums. And this is one of the most involved credits that you can get as an artist or as a person working on any sort of creative commercial project. It basically means that she oversaw and managed the entire project from start to finish. This is highly unusual for a pop star, let alone for Britney Spears, who had, until this point, had a very limited role in the creative process. She worked across the project from the writing process to the album artwork and the design, the branding, the messaging, the vision, creating the track list, choosing the collaborators. I point out that she has an EP credit on this record because Britney is often written off as untalented because she doesn't write her own music. She does have two writing credits on this record, but there's so much more to the creation of a project than just the songwriting. There are plenty of prolific, amazing, talented, visionary pop stars, Beyonce for an example, that are not always heavily involved in the writing process. It's not the be all and end all of a musician. Despite the turbulence in her personal life in this period, Every single collaborator on Blackout noted how professional Britney was and how engaged and involved she was in the process, even when her life was literally falling apart behind her. There was a moment where she was in the studio recording the day after her divorce was finalized. The creative team that she assembled for this record was largely spearheaded by two very influential producers, Danger and Bloodshy and Avant. Some producers whose work didn't make the record were Dr. Luke, Scott Storch, and Neo. And I have to say, if you listen to some of the outtakes, there are bangers in there. So Danger had worked with a lot of artists that inspired this record, Nelly Furtado's Promiscuous being a really good example of some of his work that carried over into this project, and he was a protege of Timbaland, who was certainly one of the highest paid and most influential producers of that time. I think I read somewhere that he was getting almost a million dollars to produce one song. So he gave this gritty, hard edge to Blackout. Bloodshine Avant, the other main production collaborators on this record, are a Swedish production duo, and they helped keep the record firmly in the territory of pop music. He had previously worked with Britney on another one of her strange and beautifully successful 
successful records and collaborations toxic. It's also kind of interesting to note that Blackout was mostly finished before the most turbulent year of her life began. She was pretty far from the dance floor when she was recording. In fact, she was heavily pregnant with her second child when they started the Blackout recording process. Kind of weird to think about when you are considering the material of what's on the record, but that shows you that she's a true professional and that she could see into the future. She was clairvoyant. She knew what was going to be popular and what was going to be hot and heavy in 2007 before it even happened. So Britney let Danger have a lot of creative control and he frequently mentions how freeing it was to have her blessing to experiment and try new weird and wacky things. He knows that an album like this never would have been made had someone of Britney's stature and status not been able to give him that creative freedom in the first place. He always said that Britney was very particular and knowing in her taste and he said that you would know it on her face immediately whether she was feeling a track or not feeling it and she made her feelings very clear. The way she created seems to me just from reading about it very intuitive. This is an expert and a master of the craft creating pop music and being truly guided by a honed and experienced ear not being interfered with by label executives who are presuming that they know better than the person who has been doing it for multiple years on end. So Britney continued recording Blackout all the way through her second son's birth and she wasn't even a month postpartum when she went back into the studio. Carrie Hilson who co-wrote Gimme More was completely bowled over by Britney Spears's work ethic. She mentioned that she saw her giving it 150% in the studio and that she had never seen anyone let alone a new mom work at this pace. And as I mentioned before it is important to note Britney's hard work and involvement here because so much of her public persona is about what others have said about her or done to her negatively. The writers were told not to pitch anything about her personal life to Britney, but they broke that rule to great effect. More on that later when I go through the track list. Though the writing sessions took place throughout 2006, I would argue that the true spirit of this album began with a surprise, literal DIY House of Blues tour that Britney Spears did in April of 2007, right after the infamous head shave and rehab, et cetera, et cetera. So something called the M&M's tour popped up on the House of Blues marquee overnight. No one exactly knew who it was, but it became clear very quickly that it was Britney. She charged $35 for a ticket and scalpers were selling them for up to $700. She had last toured in 2004, so this was her first live performance in three years. And for a pop star coming off a global arena tour, performance Performing with four dancers and a boombox for a 12 minute set in the House of Blues was kind of an iconic thing to do. That's punk, baby. That's punk. Her set was never longer than 20 minutes. In fact, it barely even reached 20 minutes. It was often 16 minutes. And she lip synced all of it. She changed costumes four times and she addressed the audience only to say goodnight. Britney started using her website also around this time to post cryptically about the new record, and she asked fans for naming suggestions. What should I call my new album, she said, and one of the suggestions that she posed was, oh my god, is Lindsay Lohan like, okay like? Which kind of shows that she was in on the joke of the growing culture of celebrity gossip and the paparazzi stalking around her. Let's talk about the release of the record, because that was a mess and a half. Gimme More was released in late August of 2007, just a week before what would become the infamous two 2007 Video Music Awards. The opening line of this song is instantly recognizable, perennially iconic, and inevitably memeable. It's Britney, bitch. This was such a jarring way to confront the public in her chosen medium, where we had grown used to finding her polished and perfect and communicating this almost cyborgian perfection towards us. Though the video for the song was certainly a DIY effort, that was actually incredibly difficult to shoot as Britney refused to cooperate with the director and changed the treatment for the video at the very last minute. The song itself, however, is a slick, immaculate dance floor confection. It debuted to critical acclaim. Reviewers called it futuristic, thrilling, devilishly sexy, and the production work was noted as very innovative and intricate. In my opinion, this song demonstrates the very best of what Blackout has to offer, both its strengths and its strangeness. It was a fantastic choice for a lead single, and the chorus is an earworm. Just gimme, gimme, gimme over and over with that distorted vocal saying more throughout. There is something kind of peculiar, interesting, resigned, and sad about that bridge, though. They want more, she draws. Well, I'll give them more. It was as though she was tired of being ashamed and of always losing a battle, and she was really, really giving us a shrug and giving up. Try to be the good girl, you get called a prude. Try to be the cool girl, you get called a slut. Try to be a good mom, you get called irresponsible. This was a surrender of sorts, not to her critics or to the public that was, you know, being unrelentingly cruel to her, but a surrender to the fact that no matter what she did, she was kind of damned. So she might as well just do whatever she wanted. At this point, she was also not making public appearances. The drawn-out radio promo, late-night talk show circuit, and endorsement deals were just 
not appearing with this new record. Britney was booked, however, to open the 2007 VMAs with Gimme More in September, a month before the record Blackout actually came out. She mimed the song, and to say that this performance was a disaster is kind of an understatement. And I don't mean that from the sense that it was the worst performance of all time, because I actually think that it was just a okay performance. It was kind of a mid performance. Britney is still being very charismatic, and I think there is something highly iconic about it in hindsight, but at the time you would swear that this was 9-11, the remix. She mimed the song, obviously, as she always does. I don't know why people were surprised about that in a, to be frank, terrible wig, and looked generally a bit underwhelmed to be there. In hindsight, it was so fucking bad ass and punk to be frank to show up to an event like this and basically go eh, at the camera something weird definitely happened between the performance and the dress rehearsal for the performance because there's footage of her dress rehearsal that leaked i don't know maybe a year ago where she is in an excellent wig and she's giving a lot more energy and looking a lot better than she actually did in the final product so it would be good to know from a lore perspective what exactly happened on that evening So to say that this performance was received poorly is the understatement of the century. I remember watching the news cover this in Singapore as an 11-year-old and feeling horrified at what had happened to the perennial happy-go-lucky girl next door that I had grown up with and loved. It might be hard to imagine now, but this performance made headline news around the world. Serious journalists were discussing this as though it was some very grave and terrible event. Let's look at this comment from the Associated Press to give you a sense of how over-the-top the reaction was. Kicking off the show Sunday night, with her new single, Gimme More, Spears looked bleary and unprepared. Much like her recent tabloid exploits on the streets of Los Angeles, she lazily walked through her dance moves with little enthusiasm. It appeared she had forgotten the entire art of lip syncing, and perhaps most unforgivable given her once taut frame, she looked embarrassingly out of shape. Even the celebrity-studded audience seemed bewildered. 50 Cent looked at Spears with a confused expression. Diddy, her new best friend, was expressionless. Some comeback. Here is another disgusting comment by a male reviewer for the Toronto Star. Spears looked hopelessly dazed. She was wearing the expression of someone who had been deposited at the Palms Casino Resort by a tornado, one that promptly twisted away, taking her clothing and sense of purpose. She was lumbering in slow motion as if somebody had poured cement into her streetwalker boots. That is disgusting. That is a disgusting thing to say. I think this is where the digital and the social media age really compounded the challenges that Britney was facing at this moment. Virality and the viral video as a concept was really in its nascent stages, but the response and the curiosity surrounding this uh, further iteration of her public meltdown really ignited what I would say is one of the first truly viral moments, Leave Britney Alone, a video where a fan passionately defended Britney's honor. But what was especially kind of disgusting about this new uh, era of voyeurism mediated by the relentless paparazzi culture was how much it entitled people to pass judgment on or make comments about Britney's weight, her body, her hair, etc. It was as though it was up for debate or as if her physical appearance had anything to do with us. And there are so many ways in which Britney was treated during this time that just wouldn't fly in today's social media culture, where we've become somewhat more nuanced in how we discuss others' struggles in public and our awareness of mental health issues has grown to be a lot more robust. Britney was the sacrificial lamb in so many ways. The manner in which she was treated and the consequences that that had on her life have genuinely reached shaped the ways in which the paparazzi are able to access celebrities and also has semi-influenced the tabloid culture to be a little less vitriolic at large. I want to point to an excerpt from a Rolling Stone article that I'm going to quote a couple of times called The Tragedy of Britney Spears. It was written in 2008. This excerpt gives you a sense of just how insane the tabloid culture was following her around at this time. There is one group of people who love Britney unconditionally and whose love she accepts. Every day in LA, at least 100 paparazzi, reporters, and celebrity magazine editors dash after her. This braless chick padding around town on hilariously mundane errands. The gas station, the pet store, Starbucks, Rite Aid. The multi-billion dollar new media economy rests on her slumped shoulders, with paparazzi agencies estimating that she has comprised up to 20% of their coverage for the past year. It's not only bottom feeders running after Britney. A recent leaked from the Associated Press, which plans to add 22 entertainment reporters to its staff, announces that everything that happens to Britney is news. They have already begun preparing her obituary. The paparazzi feed the celebrity magazines, which feed the mainstream press, while sources sell their dirtiest material to British tabloids, and then it trickles back to America. She is by far the top person I have ever written about on my website, ever, says Perez Hilton. Harvey Levin, founder of TMZ, said, we serialize Britney Spears. She's our President Bush. So Perez Hilton, noted cockroach and tormentor of Britney Spears, and famous misogynistic and attention whore who is honestly not roasted enough, leaked Britney Spears' album Blackout a few weeks early. So the release is pushed from November to October, and there was pretty 
much no promotion with Britney for the record, and she had fallen kind of into bad company, notably Sam Lefty, and fired her longtime manager, Larry Rudolph. She pushed away a lot of her close friends and family at this time, and it is widely believed that she was under the influence of some serious bad actors. So to give you a sense of the general chaos in her personal life, I'm going to quote again from this article. It's a rainy weekday a couple days after the VMAs. Britney knows she messed up her performance. Afterward, she kept asking, was I terrible? Was I terrible? Says a friend. This is just the way it is with her. It's circular manic thinking. And because she's not doing any promotion for Blackout other than a seven minute radio interview with Kiss FM, there's not much else going on. The firm stepped down from managing her without making a cent because they were no longer able to speak with her directly. Her phone is now answered by Sam Lefty, a jovial 33 year old who a friend of Britney describes as her life coach. They met at a party in 2007. Lefty has had two temporary restraining orders issued against him for harassment. It's Lefty who kept Britney together through the months, filling in as her assistant and trying to be a manager, talking to her record label and driving her around town. There are constant breakdowns about all the people who have sold Britney out to celebrity magazines, the assistant she forgot to pay, the bodyguard who claims he's seen her do and regularly walk around the house nude, the 21-year-old college kid she made out with topless in a hot tub on the roof of a hotel in downtown LA, a new rumor crops up every day. She feeds soda and baby bottles to her toddlers, whose teeth she has also asked a dentist to whiten. In this embattled state, Brittany has become a recluse, in a way. She's never out to dinner or at a nightclub, spending most of her nights at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. So despite all of this serious chaos, nevertheless, Blackout is born, and the packaging for this album is very 2007. The late 2000s and early 2010s has yet to come back in fashion and there's kind of a reason for that. It is underwhelming but iconic in its own way. We have a heavily overexposed cover shot that makes her look a little bit robotic in keeping with the record. It definitely blows out all of her features and she's wearing a fedora no comment on that cricket the album booklet imagery has some strange allusions to a priest as well which i can only imagine was inspired by her icon madonna so now let's get into the record the music of course we open with gimme more but the four song opening run of blackout is just maybe some of the greatest pop music of all time it truly is that good the second track on this record is peace of me produced by bloodshy and avant which robin actually recorded a demo for and i think provided some backup vocals on too there was an unspoken rule during the writing sessions for blackout or actually in general after the label rejected a song based on her breakup with Justin Timberlake back in 2003, a song called Sweet Dreams by LAX. There was this unspoken rule that the writers couldn't write about her personal life, otherwise the label would just reject the song, so why waste your time anyway? But these producers couldn't help themselves. They felt as though that Britney had a story that needed to be told and that they understood it so much that they had to write it and give it to her. Britney heard the demo and she loved it and recorded it immediately and that song ended up being Peace of Me. It was the last song recorded for this record. Her voice is heavily synthesized and pitched up and down for dramatic effect. This pitching and playing with different kind of vocal stylings is something that happens a lot on this record. The producers really realized that they needed to use her voice as the strongest asset, the through line through all of these kind of crazy sonic experimentations. But it proves how much of a recognizable force her voice is. She might not be the best technical singer, that's for sure, but she knows how to use her voice to its greatest effect. The lyrics of Piece of Me really do head on confront the media storm that's going on around her. And in true blackout fashion, she's just giving a middle finger to the consumer. I miss bad media karma. Another day another drama guess I can't see no harm in working and being a mama the question you want a piece of me is rhetorical obviously but it's also provocative she refuses to apologize and she also refuses to go away and hide and be ashamed the music video really captures the surreality that her life had become at this point it is all about her trying to go out on a night on the town with her girlfriends and having to dress up as a bunch of different Britneys to try and throw the scent off but then she starts hooking up with this guy in the club and he's secretly videotaping her it's very dramatic and very iconic but there there was kind of a lot of also behind the scenes drama with this shoot. She was very late and she changed the concept and then she put her hair up halfway through one of the shots. So the continuity of it is all messed up, but she choreographed this entire thing and she was giving it a hundred percent. The directors mentioned that she really just came to set late and kicked ass. When this video came out, of course, instead of talking about what a brilliant concept it was and how directly it addressed what was going on around her, there was much chatter about the fact that her body had been digitally retouched to look smaller. This is again, something that would maybe go not as remarked upon today as it's very obvious and we know about it and the technology has gotten better but this of course was something that she needed to be shamed for publicly this song is definitely a highlight of her album and her career nonetheless up next is another immaculate confection radar this song is so good they made her put it on her next album too just so they could make it a single i think there was actually some sort of deal where she had to make the song a single so it really needed to be on her next album circus but this is a euro disco song produced by blood shine avant that has the sickest breakdown leading into the bridge every time i hear it i go feral you have to listen to it for yourself it's a fun song about zooming in on the target of your desire break the ice is the fourth track 
and perhaps some may argue me that this is the best song on the record. She continues her long history of loving and appreciating Janet Jackson by saying, I like this part and referencing Janet Jackson's nasty in the breakdown of this song. This has an incredibly iconic opening line. It's been a while. And it definitely could have worked as a lead single too. This song technically shouldn't work because there are so many discordant elements in it, including a choir, but it slaps. And the ways that Britney uses her voice here are so impressive. How she adds dimension and texture to a track without any vocal effects at all, just by the way that she uses and modulates her own voice. There are pretty extensive working files of Blackout out there, which also makes this album a really fun and exciting one to dive into. And the Break the Ice unedited vocals are a great example of how she makes her voice work like this. This. Let's play a little bit of it so you can get the idea. It's like you got me going insane and I can't get enough. So let me get it up. Ooh, looks like we're alone now. You ain't gotta be scared, we're grown now. Track five is called Heaven on Earth, and this is one of the most compelling songs on the record. It's truly weird. It kind of envelops in on itself over and over, and there is something profoundly sad about this song. And you know, there is sadness all the way laced throughout this album, even though it is technically on its face a pop, fun, upbeat club banger. But Britney has called this song the favorite one on her record and the narrator's perspective here is really quite desperate it's someone who needs the love and company of someone else to feel okay one of the lyrics is i'd fall off the edge of my mind for you would you catch me if i jump i mean the parallels that we can see this here to the dissolution of her marriage are really quite clear get naked i got a plan now this is just some good plain old horniness <laughs> this is a song about wanting to have sex it's very sparse vocally but dangerous production work is incredible and he duets with britney here again this shows the power and the versatility of britney Britney's vocal instrument. Freak Show. This is a really strange song held together by Britney's vocals. Once again, this is a favorite of hers and she's performed it a lot since the Blackout era. This was produced also by Bloodshy and Avant, a risque, a scandalous number, one of our earliest pop examples of a dubstep sample being included into this song. And she was definitely about three years ahead of the game there with that one. Another freaky number on this record is the following track, Toy Soldier, which is often compared to Destiny's Child, Lose My Breath. I suppose it's kind of accurate from the drum line, but this is a very cheeky quintessential essentially Britney song, lots of chanting, it's a little bratty, it's a little silly, it's a bit juvenile. Track nine is one of my favorite Britney songs ever, Hot as Ice. This is like to my ears. I don't know how else to describe it. The lyrics are so bizarre. I'm cold as fire, baby, hot as ice. If you've ever been to heaven, this is twice as nice. She's singing in this like sickly sweet high register and the vocal distortions add again something really compelling and unique to this track that take it from just being like another regular pop song to being something kind of strange and odd. Ooh Ooh Baby has a flamenco guitar in it which gives it this sort of exotic sample vibe kind of similar to the string sample that is used in Toxic and and this is about beckoning a lover. It's fun, it's breezy, it's easy. Perfect Lover is another Danger production and not one of my favorites, but still a worthy inclusion on this record. The standard edition of this album closes with Why Should I Be Sad, which is a really interesting note to close the record on. And it is definitely moodier and more reflective than anything else on this record. And also the title is a great question to pose to the audience. Why do you want me to be sad? This is definitely a song about her divorce. We can hear that in many lyrics throughout. It's time for me to move along. It's time for me to get it on. I'm tired of singing sad songs. It's time for me, Britney, let go. Many of the works in progress for this record have been leaked and some of them are truly stellar and could have been included on this album very easily. There are a couple of really good bonus tracks, Out of This World and Get Back to Name a Few, but also some really interesting songs that didn't make the cut at all, like State of Grace. Britney's role as an executive producer becomes really interesting when you see how broad the working files were for this album. And it was a high caliber of material that she had to whittle down and make something tight and sharp. This track list could have easily, easily had four more songs on it. There are two kind of reflective ballads that she wrote on this record that I think, you know, add another dimension to it as well that didn't make it to the final cut, Baby Boy and Let Go. And if you're into hearing Britney's natural voice, she's often known for putting on this kind of baby voice to sing her songs. We hear that a lot throughout this record and most of her records. But if you'd like to hear her natural voice, you should look up those two outtakes. Obviously, Blackout was a bit of a facade because because she was clearly very devastated by her divorce, but it was a clever kickball change to kind of reorient or at least attempt to reorient the public's perspective away from looking at her as a spectacle or a clown or a circus performer and engaging with her as a serious artist instead. And while it might not have had that effect in the moment that it came out because it was just so drowned by all of the noise surrounding it, it definitely has had this kind of resurgence and retrospective appreciation in hindsight that I think it absolutely deserves and is so long overdue. A couple of other songs that I would recommend from the outtakes 
topics if you're interested are 911, This is a Banger, and Love to Love You is super interesting as well, which features a sample of Madonna's La Isla Bonita, and Madonna has always been an influence and a spiritual guide of sorts for Britney, so it's nice to see her citing her references there almost. So unfortunately, because Britney's breakdown was metabolizing all of the press about her, and we were so invested in her downfall and what ended up being her hospitalization and the loss of custody of her children, which followed so closely after the release of this record, that kerfuffle really kind of killed the momentum of this record. It sold around 300,000 copies in its first week, which was very good, and it debuted at number two. It should have gone number one, but there was a sneaky rule change by Billboard. None of the singles performed that well, although two of them did break the top 20, and one of them, Gimme More, broke the top 10. This is still a feat, given the fact that the only piece of promotion that she did for this record was to call Ryan Seacrest from her car and say that Heaven on Earth was her favorite song. She was coasting off the years of notoriety that she'd built up from being the most famous pop star in the world, as she should, and releasing an album and then not engaging with the promotion of it at all punk behavior. In the same publications that were slandering and body shaming her, Britney's record was revered for being a genuinely great pop album born amidst the madness of her life. And it was so good that it didn't even take a retrospective appreciation to fully get it. It was definitely received as a good album the first time that it came out. I'm going to quote from the Pitchwork review of this record in 2007 because shockingly they clocked its importance at the time. If Britney seems marginalized on Blackout, it's because her voice is being constantly splintered, chopped, and interrupted. From the moment a chorus of voices barge into Gimme More, the album surrenders its vocal center. Britney is subjected to sudden dropouts, octave falls, pitch bending, stutters, and warps, often afflicting only a word or two at once. When people criticize autotune, it's because the technique smooths vocals over to create faultless, airless productions. Blackout is a masterclass in autotune and vocal treatment as a studio instrument, disrupting and jamming the songs as much as it helps them. The effect is oddly sinister. Blackout is superb modern pop, which probably only could have been released by this star at this moment. Britney is a walking catastrophe, makes for great car crash copy, and her record can fit into that if you want it to. But what makes it so great isn't the central good girl gone bad story it's the strangeness of the story that was liberated and britney's off-disc life is both distraction from and enabler for this extraordinary album so that's probably as good a place as any to wrap up my discussion of the album blackout and its legacy and its impact and its excellence i just feel like i don't see this album delved into a lot it's not an album often cited i think by pop music lovers as one of the best pop albums of all time though it's frequently and often cited by other pop stars as really influential and an incredible record overall i am you know always rooting for britney I'm a huge Britney fan and I love this album. I listen to it all the time. Revisiting it was so much fun. If you've never listened to Blackout before, I would be so curious to hear what your thoughts are on it. What songs kind of stand out to you? Does it sound dated? To me, a lot of the songs from this period of time do sound dated, but Blackout is evergreen, I think. It's so contemporary. It feels so cool. It still feels so relevant. I never get the sense that it is an album created a long time ago or something created in an era of cringe. So if you've never listened to it before, let me know what songs you like. And if you are a Britney head like I am if you're part of the Britney army let me know what was always your favorite song how has your relationship to this record changed over time and what do you think about how people are revising the record on it now people are really interested in talking about how great it was and you know what I love to hear that conversation let's have it and if you're interested in this video and you like thoughtful weekly content then you have to subscribe to Swiftologist because that's what I do I'm the Swiftologist all right I will see you in my next video goodbye